I'll bet you thought a tutorial about hammers wouldn't be as interesting as this one is going to be, because believe it or not, there's a lot you may not know about this essential tool, and matching the right tool to the job can make a surprising level of difference. In this video, I'm going to go through the types of hammers and mallets I use and tell you why, including some I bet you've never used before, but probably should. So let's start with a cross peen hammer. These come in different shapes and sizes and under different names, including joiner's hammer, or some are called Warrington hammers, named after the town in England where they were developed in the 1860s. Whatever you call it, the main characteristics are a slightly conical striking face on one end and a wedged shape on the other. This is used to drive the types of small nails and brads that are most common to furniture and cabinet making. The wedged end has two functions. It can strike a small nail head that's pinched between your fingers without hitting your fingers, and it can help you drive that nail straight downward because all the striking power is concentrated at the center of the head's mass. This helps you avoid a glancing blow that may come from striking unevenly with the full face. Of course, it can be difficult to hit the nail head with such a narrow point on every stroke. But once you get it started with a couple of light taps, the nail's path should be set and you can finish with some more robust swings using the other end. I know we drive most nails these days with pneumatic tools, but every workshop should have some sort of cross peen hammer for those times when you do need to drive small brads by hand, such as for fastening the back of a picture frame in or installing small moldings. A ball peen hammer is a metalworking tool that every woodworking shop should have as well. It's for shaping more than it is for driving nails, particularly the ball-shaped end. One common shop use is to peen the brass ends of pins to secure metal plates or hardware. Because all the force is concentrated at a very small point of contact, you can be very precise with this type of hammer. Ball peen hammers come in many different sizes, and I recommend picking up more than one. They're very common at yard sales and flea markets, especially around rural communities, so just keep your eyes open. Hardwood mallets are the staple in modern workshops because they produce a lot of force without doing so much damage to tool handles. These come in many different shapes and sizes, and it's worth owning more than one. A turned mallet handle like this one is perhaps the easiest to make yourself if you own a lathe. We made one several years ago in a video. One drawback of this style is the long grain striking surface, which isn't as durable as the end grain faces on a barrel style mallet like this one. One of my favorites though is the traditional joiner's mallet because it has the balance of the turned style, but it has the end grain striking faces that come on the barrel style. Also note that the faces are angled downward at five degrees, so they strike flat in a comfortable motion. This type is a little more difficult to make yourself, but it can certainly be done. I buy my mallets, the ones that I don't make, from a small family-owned business called Taylor Tools, which I'll link to below. They are the sponsor of this video, and they are well worth checking out. If I have to order a tool online, I always check with them first. And if you use my link when you do, you'll help support this channel as well. Not all pounding has to be gentle, though. This is called a lump hammer. Now, don't confuse this with a regular sledgehammer. This is specifically designed for persuading, not for smashing. These have long been used by woodworkers for chopping and assembling joinery, because the two and a half pound weight of the head can do a lot of the work for you. It takes a lot less muscle power, for example, to chop a mortise in hardwood with this than it would a wooden mallet. It can be a little hard on your tool handles if they aren't banded with metal to prevent mushrooming, but you'll be surprised how much you like letting the tool just drop and do the work for you. A lump hammer can also be used to assemble dovetails and carcass construction and other types of joinery by choking up on the handle or down to vary between strong blows and delicate taps. I got mine for crucible tools, it's kind of a premium tool, but you could try out a small two or three pound mini sledge just to see if you like that kind of hammer. The handle on that will probably be a little long and awkward, but it'll do the job. At the other end of the spectrum is the dead blow mallet. While a lump hammer or even a wooden mallet 
can leave dents in wood depending on how you use them. A dead blow mallet is very unlikely to cause any damage. So this is my choice for assembling finished project parts that won't be sanded or planed later. Don't mistake this for a hard rubber mallet like this one. A dead blow mallet is hollow inside the head and filled with lead or steel beads. This gives it more mass and produces a solid strike that doesn't bounce off the surface. That dead blow delivers more power for such a compact size and it really works well. I prefer smaller versions, around 10 to 14 ounces. That doesn't mean though that I don't like a good solid rubber mallet from time to time. Not so much on furniture, but definitely on my machinery. This is ideal, for example, to adjust the wings on your table saw along the seam or the fence rail, um, getting a pulley on a shaft. It delivers a heavy blow without denting metal. I got this one, I think, at Harbor Freight or some hardware store, but I've actually been eyeing one of those lower bounce versions with the replaceable plastic faces, so I might be upgrading on this. If you do any wood carving like me, you want to pick up a small brass mallet. This one is about 500 grams, which is just over a pound. That mass is used with light taps to steer a carving gouge rather than chopping. You can hold it by its handle if you want, but it's usually handled by its head. It really gives you a lot more control than you might have when you're pushing the gouge all by itself. This is also Narex, which I got from Taylor Tools. Finally, what workshop would be complete without at least one claw hammer? I use the larger 16 ounce version, actually this one's 28 ounce, uh, the most, especially outside the shop, but I use the smaller one for more delicate work. Obviously this type of hammer excels at driving nails, but it's also, of course, a nail puller. Interestingly, a lot of people take claw hammers for granted. They assume they're all the same. But a good hammer is well balanced with a comfortable handle of the proper length and a firmly fixed head. The striking face should be slightly domed and the claw should have a nice sharp point between them for pulling even the smallest nails. Sadly, many hardware store hammers are better called hammer shaped objects and I recommend looking for a vintage hammer, if you don't mind some patience searching at estate sales and online. Both of mine are more than 100 years old. This one is probably about 200 years old. I love this strap style head, but the wedge style is easier to fix if it gets a little bit loose. As I said, you might want to look at some used sources for some of these if you need any of these hammers or mallets in your shop. If you do decide to buy something new, I'll link to some of my favorites below. I hope this video has shown you that there is more to this subject than you may have realized, and I'll see you next time. For a hundred-year-old company, Narex sure has some secrets. Like how can they make so many tools of such quality at such affordable prices? And why didn't I know about this company's rich history before? Narex is just full of surprises. Check them out at the link below this video.